Hi everyone, uh, it's John Coleman here and ready to receive your questions. Uh, you can basically ask me anything about Scrum. Uh, while I'm waiting for some of your questions to come in, I'll just uh, maybe talk about some of the more recent changes to the uh, to the Scrum Guide in the 2020 with a new version of the Scrum Guide. And I, overall, I would welcome it. Um, it's uh, more open to um, Scrum in non-software contexts. And for the last three years, uh, that's where I've kind of been working outside software, even though I'm originally a software developer. Uh, most, rec most recently working in marketing and sales. Um, so your questions are very welcome. Uh, all you need to do is just add a comment onto whichever channel you're on and uh, we'll uh, try to get your answer as soon as possible. While I'm waiting for some of your questions to come in, I just want to share with you uh, some of my views on the 2020 Scrum Guide. So I'm just going to turn off some of the, the branding here so that we can uh, see, see more and uh, we can uh, get started. Okay, so the 2020 Scrum Guide um, is something uh, I made an interpretation of uh, a few months ago, and I came up with this visualization. Uh, and you can see here on the, the top, uh, top left uh, corner, you can see the, the product goals. So uh, in addition to Scrum uh, in in the 2020 guide is the uh, the commitment of the product goal to um, through the product backlog. So the idea is that uh, there's one active product goal, um, and we'll talk about what a product goal is uh, shortly. There's one active product goal. You could have some other ones that are not active yet. You could have some product backlog items in the product backlog that are maybe seeding some new um, uh, product goals uh, that aren't active yet. But to all intents and purposes, most of the product backlog has items with, which are related to the current product goal. I used to think that the product goal was, um, was just uh, uh, another way of saying the vision, that they just did a word substitution. But when I kind of dug into it a bit more, it could be the vision. But also, it's, um, it's probably more likely to be maybe some subset of your kind of direction of travel. So. I like to talk about different time horizons and so maybe the five plus years almost impossible perfection vision like Elon Musk trying to get to Mars, you know, building life on, on Mars and building cities and so on. Almost impossible. Doesn't mean you shouldn't aim for it. Um, landing on the dark side of the moon would, moon, which would be kind of something I think they're aiming to do within a year or something like that. And then we had a few uh, docks with the International Space Station la at the end, uh, end of last year. Two automated docks and one manual dock. So they would have been uh, a closer time horizon so you'd have like three to six months or one to three years or five plus years almost impossible perfection vision um scrum doesn't prescribe that uh, the product goal is is fitting any of those particular time horizons but it's more likely to be the shorter time horizon and um, maybe three to six months could be up to a year but it could actually be the almost impossible perfection vision as well uh, because scrum can be used in different contexts there's nothing wrong with you um you know, adapting accordingly. Um, the other thing you probably noticed about the product backlog is I've uh, I've kind of got it barcoded in different colors here uh, because uh, you might have different stakeholders. The stakeholders are kind of represented at the kind of the bottom of the screen. There are different colors. So maybe hopefully um, customers, end users, but you might have some internal stuff that needs to be done as well. And... Um, when you know when you're doing all that internal stuff, do you, do you set up a, a specific Scrum team for a project? And my own view is that it's probably not the best idea um, for a number of reasons. Uh, it takes a while for a team to get used to a new way of working like Scrum. Um, so you know, uh, it, we would want to be a very elite team in order to say, "Oh, we're going to do a, a Scrum project for three weeks." Uh, it doesn't sound very sensible. Why did you just meet every day, kind of thing? Uh, but also can be a bit sad when you've got a team that's performing really, really well. They've gone, they've gone through the pain of, of uh, figuring out Scrum and figuring out value delivery with Scrum, and uh, then they get disbanded because the project budget is over. So, what I prefer to see, even though there's a bit of a trade-off here because you've got uh, multiple projects going on, uh, hopefully what we can do is we can we can order order subcomponents of those projects, uh, and so you might the red project would be breaking up, very high value item there at the top. 
uh, of the backlog and then down a bit again you've got another bit of red and then uh, so you can kind of use 80 20. so maybe you can get you know 80 percent of the value from maybe doing 20 percent of the work so trying to get people into the mindset of uh doing uh doing more of that um so the the the, the essentially in this case what i'm showing here is a, a product team um working together a scrum team working on a product um that might have some projects as part of that um but as such there it's a long-term stable team that you're, you're trying to you're trying to foster here uh you can see then that um uh in the circle you've got the rhythm of the team I, i'm going to zoom, zoom into that shortly and essentially what's happening is work moves off the top of the product backlog and goes into uh, sprint planning and in sprint planning if i kind of zoom in on that a little bit um if i just kind of go down and kind of zoom that up a bit so in sprint planning we have three topics now so there were two topics in the 2017 guide uh now there's three so i'm kind of using the metaphor there of a kind of a uh a golf flag there you know on the green uh, as you're you're aiming for to to get the ball into the hole so to speak if you're playing golf and um so what's our goal for the sprint what's uh, our business objective if you like for the sprint and then you can see number two you got these are the three items which happen to be from three three different projects because the three different colors representing the stakeholders and each of those items has maybe multiple tasks and the team can use a scrum board or they can use a kanban board as well uh, to uh, to deal with that that's uh, the scrum guy doesn't talk about scrum boards or kanban boards but in practice that's what they tend to do you, t you don't have to use task breakdown but uh, here in this example um, this example just kind of makes it easier to explain so topic one is you know why are we doing this work what's our objective topic two uh what are we doing and three like uh how are we doing it and the sprint goal doesn't really get settled uh it doesn't have to be settled at the end of sprint planning because maybe you maybe when you get into the detail and the how you might understand that actually you can do more work or actually it's too big uh, we, we get we can uh it's less work that we uh that we need to be doing um in addition to that what you'll notice as well in the in the 2020 scrum guide is uh there are accountabilities now instead of roles um so you've got the product owner accountability uh maximizing value the developers you know committing to the definition done in the sprint goal um, and delivering value as part of the scrum team and the scrum master for the first time is is now on the hook for the effectiveness of the scrum team so that's kind of interesting right so um self-managing team but the scrum master's on the hook for the effectiveness of the team so kind of interesting how that's going to play out a um, couple of tweaks as well with the uh, even though the three pillars were always there uh, and the 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 transparency inspection and adaptation to improve empirical process control and the five scrum values which in my view are helped to offset the uh, the five dysfunctions of a team um, not only it does the scrum team need to exhibit those behaviors in the 2020 guide uh they talk about actually the stakeholders um embracing the three pillars and the scrum values as well so and you can see here down here that uh, if the team is doing planning at the start and then they meet every day to talk about how they're going to achieve the sprint goal at the end of the sprint they have a sprint review and instead of talking about a potentially uh releasable increment uh there's no talk of a uh, in different parts of the guide they're not they're not in the same phrase but you see the words valuable useful and usable appearing uh for each of those so that's kind of interesting and recognition as well that you could have more than one increment as well during the sprint um which is nice and then of course you got the improvements which is an expectation this is improvements although the 2017 guy they used to say that when you did your retrospective that uh you more or less had to have at least one improvement action in the in the sprint backlog of the next sprint or that was the expectation uh they made they, they kind of relaxed that a little bit in 2020 because maybe you could do some of those improvements straight away actually maybe you've got a new team agreement or you do some system modeling or you reviewed your scrum values or you just uh had a good conversation uh you know this improvements don't have to be of the prop but the process could be about how we interact with each other and so on um for the first time in the 2020 guide we see the the word customer i think the word end users in there as well and uh, uh that's a big uh, big welcome for me for, for that one uh, stakeholders of course implicitly include um, customers and end users but it's nice to see it made explicit and um as well as getting feedback from the 
from the stakeholders, um, not just at the sprint review, but maybe at other times. Uh, hopefully, hopefully we're also talking to customers, seeing if there's changes to customer behavior, maybe looking at analytics as well. I like what Marty Kagan says. He talks about product manager as opposed to product owner, but, but he says a good product manager, product owner in a scrum context would be looking at the analytics, maybe one to one and a half hours a day, understanding what's going on, because uh, if, particularly if you've got a product that's really scaled, it's going across millions of users, you know, there's only so many customers you can talk to, there's only, only so many focus groups that you can kind of get get into. Um, the other big thing that I noticed in the 2020 guide is that um, product backlog refinement is now encouraged and um, uh, it's encouraged more rather. And so before they said, you know, you might do refinement, it's uh, up to 10% of the spend. They took they took away that mention of the, the 10% uh, and uh, really they're, they're more or less recommending it. You know, we're, we're striving for a better common understanding of the problems that we're trying to solve and for whom. Um, so hopefully the customers, end users, uh, stakeholders are in refinement. The, hopefully the product owner is acting as a matchmaker between the developers and the and the stakeholders, uh, including the customers, end users. Maybe they're even designing experiments, uh, kind of a hat tip there to Lean UX, uh, but you can do experiments regardless whether you have Lean UX or not. So really nice to see the uh, the promotion, of, stronger promotion of the uh, of product backlog refinement as an activity in single team scrum, of course, as most of you know, a Nexus and a less uh, product backlog refinement is uh, is essentially an event and it's, it's something that's mandatory. So, because uh, when you get multiple teams working together, you really do need to make sure you line up all your ducks and um, have a clear understanding of what we're trying to, what we're trying to achieve. Uh, the other major change I would say um, in the 2020 guide is that uh, the protocol is now a commitment to the, um, to the product backlog. We're striving, I would say, the commitment is in terms of striving uh, that we're we're trying to or we're trying to achieve some, trying to hit some hit, hit in some direction, we're trying to achieve some outcomes, uh, maybe some impact, and uh, we're trying to be clear about what we're trying to achieve. And then every sprint, hopefully, the sprint goal is iterating towards uh, the the product goal. So the product goal is a commitment to the product backlog in the twenty twenty guide, and the sprint goal is a commitment. Uh, to the sprint backlog and it's now actually included in the sprint backlog so uh that's an, an interesting development and and definition done before was kind of uh we didn't know what to call it it was just we knew you you, you needed to do it in scrum.org uh, a lot of people say if you say scrum in two words it's done increment and uh definition done is our commitment to the increment so if we talk about hardness of commitments uh we're striving to achieve the product goal we're striving to uh to attain the sprint goal and Hopefully, most of the time we're doing that. Um, if there are some difficulties arising during the sprint, where we realize that that might be unattainable, if we want to uh, maintain our standard of quality, hopefully the uh, definition of done is the the hardest of the commitments. And uh, but the, there might be some exceptional circumstances where you decide to take the value and maybe take on some technical debt consciously, put that on the product backlog and, and deal with that later. But that's kind of an exceptional situation. In most cases, uh, the one thing that we would not compromise would be the deficit of done, because that's kind of how we do, that's kind of how we do a work around here. So on this visualization, um, if you look at my uh, blog and scrum the go scrum the go to the blog, search my name, the, 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 this blog is, or this image, is uh, represented in the what has changed in the in, in what's uh, changed in the 2020 guide. Uh, you'll also see I've got a kind of a legend here as well. So uh, kind of uh, dark red for event, uh, gray for artifact, blue for commitment. Um, uh, green is for like my interpretation, it, it, just my opinion. And then it's kind of a thing. People ask me, what is a kind of a thing as well? It's a kind of a thing. It's uh, something that seems to be getting hard, but they haven't, they kind of haven't given it a name yet. So like, you know, we have a self-managing cross-functional team of 10 people or less. The Scrum team commits to the protocol, inspects and adapts the artifacts and multiple Scrum teams, very welcome this edition, multiple Scrum teams on the same product, share the same protocol, product backlog and product owner and comply with the same definition of done. So that's my little uh, whistle stop tour of the 2020 guide. And I'm just going to check in uh, to see if you have uh, any comments or questions and I could just see there's a couple of comments here. Uh, so one of them is from Daniel uh, Carrillo. So I just uh, turn off my background image so we can just uh, see it a little bit more. And um, so in the previous version of the scrum.org representation of the scrum framework, 
the increment comes after the review now it comes after smile what do you think about it i don't understand what you mean daniel if you want to come on come on camera you can but you've got a follow-up comment as well which i'll just read uh now it comes before so um trying to understand what your, what your question is here so in the previous version of the scrum the raw representation of the scrum framework the increment comes after the review Okay, so I think the reason, um, I'm just guessing that the reason behind that is because even though it was kind of obvious that you could have more than one increment every sprint in the 2017 guide, they've made it explicit that you could have one plus. Um, and, uh, but it still, yeah, it still doesn't explain the answer to, it doesn't give the answer to your question because you're saying before uh, that it comes after, no, it becomes, uh, you're mixing me up, Daniel, no, it becomes before you're saying, yeah. So it would make more sense that essentially uh, if you could do one plus increments in a sprint, then hopefully uh, the sprint view isn't the first time that you have an increment. I, I, that would be my takeaway from that. Uh, that would be my take on it. Eric has got a comment as well. Why leave PAR out, PBR? Why leave uh, product backlog refinement out? Um, good question, Eric. Um, I wouldn't leave it out. <laughs> um, it's still in the guide. It's, it's actually more encouraged now than it ever was. Um, it's, I think, any decent um, Scrum team is going to be doing product backlog refinement because what you're doing is the metaphor I use is like, uh, like Pac-Man. You know, you're kind of, you're trying to go down through the backlog and you're trying to uh, understand it. I think the first thing is, do we as a team understand uh, our, our product backlog? Uh, do we understand what's coming up next? Do we have a common understanding? It's not good enough that one person who's very good at understanding requirements understands. We all need to understand it together. Um, so uh, for me, it's crucial. Um, I don't know how we manage without it. I'd be very uncomfortable. I did have some teams where we didn't do refinement, where literally we went into sprint planning and like it was like, okay, what are we going to do? I like, can literally we were writing items there and then on the spot. It was a bit stressful, Eric. And um, but it actually, as it turned out, it was the second best team I ever had, and that's how they worked it. But um, I don't think we're setting ourselves up for success without doing refinement. Um, Eric, I'd be curious to hear about your views about, you know, what do you do? What do you do refinement or not? Um, uh, Daniel has come back with a thumbs up. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's the right answer, Daniel, but I think it's kind of reasonable, isn't it? If there's more, more than one increment in the sprint, then, you know, it should be should be ready before the sprint review, really. And was, wasn't that always the case, really? You know, it's almost like you'd wonder why we waited till now to, to make that change. Um, I think the other biggest thing as well, I would say, is that uh, the... The, wor the words related to software have really been extracted from the 2020 guide. Um, the one word that's left, I guess, would be developer. And uh, I'm not sure, is that a missed opportunity or is that a good idea? Um, I, it's, it's, it's interesting that now what they're trying to do, I think, is make uh, the Scrum guide amenable to people in any school of thought, really, you know, in any type of knowledge work. You know, I'd be careful about saying you could do it in any type of knowledge work. I think you need to test it in that, in that environment before you can uh, be true that that would actually work. And I know from working in non-software for the last three years that there are some subtle differences. And a uh, key one for me is, you know, can we deliver an increment within 30 days? Because when you're doing sprints, um, the idea is that you're you're inspecting and adapting. You're going through the, the four formal events within the informal uh, sprint uh, event for the container for the for the sprint, and you're uh, hopefully you're you're collaborating on what to what to do next. It's going to be very difficult to collaborate on what to do next if you can't deliver something in thirty days. So that's why be careful about saying you can do it any kind. Of, there might be some types of work that take longer than thirty days, uh, although there are lots of techniques in terms of how we can break that down. Um, so um, hope that uh, hope that makes sense. Um, other things as well, while I'm waiting for you to kind of put some comments in and let me know, Eric, if I've answered your answered your question. Um, I think uh, the other thing that I really like about the 2020 version of the guide is uh, the way that uh, the Scrum values need to be embraced now by the stakeholders. It, before, it was, it was all the Scrum team. And uh, I'm not sure is that... Uh, 
you know, like just expecting the scrum team that we, we, you know that they'll comply with the scrum values, they'll be transparent, and then their stakeholders are less than transparent. So now, uh, Rome wasn't built in a day, but um, you know, it's uh, yeah, it's you know something to be careful about. I've got another question from Daniel Carrillo. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so, what do you think Scrum Master is responsible for efficiency of? Scrum team. So the first thing, Daniel, is um, what is said in the guide is the effectiveness, uh, I think, rather than efficiency. And uh, you know this better than anybody because I know you well, Daniel. So, but um, um, but I'll address your question as well. Um, but effectiveness is going. Are we doing the right thing? And you know, efficiency. Whatever we're doing, are we doing? Are we doing it well? You know, are we kind of getting better at it, kind of thing. Um, so. For me, um, how can the Scrum Master be, re be responsible, you know, for the effectiveness of the team? Uh, first of all, can they, be, uh, can they be responsible for the efficiency of the team, which is your question? And for me, this is like a personal opinion now. I know I'm a PhD and all that, but this is John, John Cohen speaking personally. Um, I would say that, um, you know, we have to be very careful with the uh, with, uh, messing around with the... Uh, self-management of the team they, that's another thing as well that changed the 2020 guide they moved from self-organization to self-management and i'm hope they're i'm hoping they're thinking of richard hackman in terms of you know deciding you know uh not only how you do your work but uh, what and when kind of thing uh, i hope that's uh, that's where they're going uh, as opposed to the wording in the actual guide itself um uh, but uh, scrum for me isn't efficient it helps you to improve your efficiency um because you go into a rhythm and you can deal with complicated and and and, and complex work if you like to and you can deal with those kind of problems uh but there's lots of meetings and so on uh, which do help they actually help to uh reduce waste and so on so that that in a sense in essence is improving efficiency indirectly uh but um you know it's uh for there's there's a lot of uh, blue work, as Dave Marquet says in one of his most recent books, red work is when you're doing the work, and blue work is when you're sitting back and you're pausing, you're thinking about, you know, am I doing the right thing? And so I like the the level of blue work that we have in. It's not just focusing execution all the time. It's like, okay, what should we do in this sprint? Okay, what should we do in the next twenty four hours? You know, uh, what have we done, and how's the market responding? And I know we said we, I know we said that's the protocol, but actually, does the protocol need to be tuned based on what's happening in the market? Um, uh, in the retrospective, you know, uh, can, you know, can we, how can we collaborate better with each other and so on? So it's really more about effectiveness than efficiency. And how can the Scrum Master help with that? I think in um, in basically monitoring the self-management, uh, monitoring is probably too strong a word, but observing, you know, the, the evolution of the self-management of the team, uh, seeing that, hopefully seeing that the Scrum team are facilitating their own events because it says the guide uh, Scrum Master facilitates as requested or as needed. And I hope you're neither requested nor needed, uh, that you're involved, you're there to help if, uh, if needed. But uh, I hope the product owners looking after topic one, topic two of sprint planning. I hope the developers looking after topic three. I hope the developers looking after the daily Scrum. I hope the product owner, you know, is uh, looking after the, the sprint review, but maybe you could uh, ask someone else to do it. And maybe the Scrum Master's only gig is, uh, in my book, is looking after the retrospective. But And even then, they might ask somebody else to do that. So I think uh, fostering the self-management, trying to create an environment where uh, where um, the team is working well, but also using the three services. You know, are, are we serving the team? Are we serving the product owner? Are we, uh, uh, what are we doing with the organization? Are there some impediments uh, we can sprinkle the whole company with Scrum, but if we're not fixing impediments, organizational problems, like you know how people get motivated to get promoted, for example, if they're if they're being motivated to uh, uh, you know to be better than their colleagues in the team, well, it's not going to be very good for Scrum. It's it's going to be they might get promoted, but it's so that's like an organizational thing that needs to change. And so working with the organization to fix that. So very long answer, uh, Daniel, but short answer would be using the three services. Uh, of the scrum master and uh, not losing sight of the organizational uh the organizational service make sure the organization is working to improve as well that that we're basically fixing problems daniel let me know if that answered it sorry if i went on a bit too long talking about that uh eric came back saying um 
Yes, uh, yeah, stay is very important. Absolutely, I think it's more important than ever in the 2020 guide and uh, in Nexus and, and and less where you have three teams or above. Typically, uh, they're saying you, you have to have it. So I, I think you should have it. Really, I think we should be looking ahead all the time, like Pac-Man. It's almost like pre-planning. And if you're doing your refinement on a on a, on a rhythm, planning is the dawdle. You might you might be done in 20 minutes. You won't need to. You won't need the full time box. Uh, Daniel saying uh, thank you. Um, Ahmad has a question. So, how do you determine the maturity of the scrum team? Oh, this this is a little bomb you've just given me. Nice, nice, uh, nice little hot potato you gave me there, Ahmad. It's a difficult one. So, I'm not a huge fan of maturity models. I'm not a huge fan. In the leadership class in scrum org, we do have one, and it is useful as long as you uh don't use it to judge others uh, you know you don't put a, put a poster on the wall level one to five and say oh amma's level five and john's level one like that's not gonna that's not going to be good right because as soon as you embarrass people you just uh i think the change is dead really uh but it can be useful for you as a scrum master to look at mm, okay so i've got a team who's a very high level of self-management they're giving lots of value they've got they've got a proven track record and they they want uh, they want an extra person in their team. We've tried to convince them that maybe they shouldn't have an extra person because they might mess things up. But they say no, no, no. We need an extra person. Uh, that's probably not the time to be saying, well, the manager is going to select the person for the team. You know what I mean? You probably want to trust the team with that. Give them the budget. Give them access to the HR resources, and off they go. So you can use maturity models to to help you understand what might be the right intervention to help. But I'd be very slow to kind of put those posters on the wall and compare teams of what, what kind of level do I think they're at. Um, I have three talks on my YouTube channel, Ahmad, on measurement. Um, so if you're talking about maturity for me, it, it's, it's almost not the right question. It should be more about how do we measure the success of our scrum team? And, and can we? And I did three talks on that. One of them is with uh, Mark Noneman. He's a, he's a kind of a, a key guy in evidence-based management um, at scrum.org, and he's an independent himself. Uh, also, Ben Maynard is my most recent talk of measurement uh, only last week, uh, sorry, the week before last. And I also had a talk, talk with John Seddon as well. So, and what John Seddon was basically saying was, um, it's important to know what direction you're going in, but don't let the measures become a proxy for the vision or where your, your direction that, People, if people figure out what the measures are, they might make that that might be their game rather than actually where we're trying to go. So be careful with measures. There's devils in every measure, and it's a huge topic. And uh, maybe may, maybe measurement is something we can kind of dig into if nobody else has any questions later on. Ahmed. But how do you determine the maturity of the team? Just standing back, I would say, I'd be looking at are they delivering value? Uh, are they delivering increments? Um, are we getting feedback from customers? Are they reacting to what's going on? Is the backlog fairly stable? Like, which is kind of a bad sign that we're not really learning. Yeah, are they experimenting? Is it is the team experimenting, or are they just kind of doing taking orders and just delivering stuff? Um, there's all sorts of signals. I could talk for about half an hour about that. Um, at, let me know if that kind of gives you a quick answer uh, to that question, and feel free to give me a follow up question as well. Um, at, thank you. Uh, I've got another question from uh, Mike Levings. So Scrum Master should be a mirror to reflect back the team's effectiveness, in, in Mike's opinion. And yeah, I kind of go along with that, I think. Um, um, there are There's a number of stances of a Scrum Master, and uh, we cover that in the PSM2 workshop. And so the, 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 you know, the dominant ones would be you know, a mentor, which is like um, answering questions, giving advice when asked. Um, coaching, uh, maybe asking questions when, when you have permission to coach. I'm slow to coach when I don't have permission. I don't like when people are going all Socratic on me when I've actually never given them permission to coach me. In the first place, that's just a personal opinion. Uh, sometimes I'll ask for permission to teach because uh, I might say, well, I take a kind of a just-in-time approach with training. I know I'm a trainer, but teams that actually get trained just in time perform better in my experience. So, so if there's something coming up that I feel they might need to nugget on something, I will, uh, I will deal with that. Um, and uh, I'd say, can, look, guys and gals, uh, there's something you need to know here might really help you. Uh, do you want to kind of take it? Can I, can I go into this for 15 minutes? So, yeah, 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 go ahead. And then they, that might, you know, because they don't know what they don't know. So then I say, no, they're, they're aware of another option. 
and they'll either go for it, they won't go for it. Removing impediments, obviously, uh, fixing problems, working with managers as well to fix problems. Uh, and of course, um, you know, making sure, you know, be, being the uh, being the kind of a, a, a leading example of agility as well. But being a mirror, um, I would just, um, I'd be just careful uh, about inflicting help, Mike. You know, I, I know that's what you, what, not what you mean, but you know what I mean by inflicting help or I, I help someone and they didn't ask me for help, you know. I need to make sure that they're receptive, that they're willing to listen to me. Uh, that's the John Coleman view now, as opposed to any official scrum that argue that uh, I like to make sure that people are ready to hear what I have to say before I say anything, because I'm just wasting my time otherwise. Um, call me cynical. <laughs> uh, let me know what you think of that, Mike. Um, thank you. Um, so, Eric, uh, taking the feel feelings of team members into account, I would say I leave everyone speaking up. Yeah. Um, and I'd say as well, Eric, you know, creating the space where people feel comfortable um, saying things. I remember I broke one of the rules of Scrum one day um, and uh, the retrospective went on for far too long. And uh, it probably wasn't very nice of me, but I said, we're not leaving this room until you tell me what's going on because something's really badly wrong, wrong here. And after an hour and a half, someone cracked and they said they admitted what was going on. And then, and then I did have, uh, they did have uh, one of the best teams I've ever come across. Um, but they were struggling at that point in time. I wouldn't recommend it. I would probably wouldn't do it these days. But um, you know, create an environment where people do want to speak up. And probably today, I'd probably be more, much more soft about that and just try to make sure that people feel psychologically safe about um, actually doing that. Thank you, Eric. Let me know if you have any comments or you know, if anything you don't like what I'm saying as well. Just let me know. I'm, I'm uh, big enough to take it. So uh, shoot away. And Ahmed saying uh, yes, it is. Uh, yeah, no worries, Ahmed. Um, so any more questions from anybody about Scrum? So anything you want to know about Scrum? So anything that's troubling you that uh, you'd really love to kind of understand more, uh, understand more about it? Anything that you want to kind of understand more about Scrum? In particular, maybe what's changed in the, in the 2020 guide? You might even have some questions about scaling. I'm OK with that. But uh, I'm more comfortable with the scaling frameworks, um, Nexus and Less. And I, I, I'm very up to speed on the other ones as well, but I'm not really comfortable going to that area with other people who practice those, those all the time, and they'd be uh, probably better people to uh, to talk about those. Um, OK, just, got, uh, just checking if there's any more. There's got another one here. Thank you, Daniel. Something else I forgot to talk about. What do I think about removing the three daily questions example? Uh, they were an example, not a prescription in the first place, indeed. Um, it's funny, isn't it? You give people a system and they, I don't know, they you give people any system and they kind of abuse it, really. <laughs> and so the three questions were in there. And uh, uh, it was like people thought, well, what did I do yesterday? What am I doing today? Do I have any impediments? And we just ended up with really boring, uh, boring daily scrums. And... Um, I much prefer to kind of walk the wall at work, so to speak, and, you know, the team would walk the wall at work themselves. And, uh, you know, maybe he has three items in the sprint to deliver the goal, and maybe Daniel talks about one, and Eric talks about another, and Ahmed talks about another. Maybe I chip in if there's, uh, uh, you know, if I did some work in that as well. But it's not about showing how busy I am. And that's a big thing as well, that people seem to use the three questions, I think, for the wrong reason. I think it's because... I think it's because they don't feel safe not being busy. Um, um, I have to work with people to help them to uh, realize that I'm totally comfortable with people having slack uh, because we get more done, work done if we have slack because you've got more time to think. You can be more focused and uh, all that kind of stuff. And, and as Eric says, it's on the board now, so you can just uh, walk, in the, walk, walk the board, uh, walk the board together. So I, I was delighted um, that the three questions were removed, uh, Daniel. Um, I thought they were an abomination. I was. I thought they should have been got rid of years ago. Um, but yeah. So uh, thank you for that question. Let me know if that addressed it. Uh, Claudio's got a question about Nexus. Uh, so is there any change in Nexus? So you might remember in the Scrum Guide we had development team and um, and and that's no uh, there's no developers instead of development team. Um, so that kind of messed things up a little bit. So so now instead of like if the Nexus integration team had 
maybe representatives uh, of each team say um uh then it would be representatives of each scrum team as opposed to each uh but most, uh, hopefully developers uh there might be one scrum master one product owner hopefully there should be only one product owner across the entire product uh one scrum master and maybe representatives then developers the other team so there's nothing major there but what was interesting was the uh, refinement was already in there but now they're talking about cross team refinement which i which i really like and that's something that they encourage in less as well um uh, where they have multi-team refinement so you in less there's like uh, overall refinement where you have representatives maybe from teams meeting with the product owner or maybe uh um uh, and, and say, okay, which items do you want to kind of figure out in the next few sprints uh, in product, back, product backlog? I'm also planning to do it that way. And uh, then each team, you know, can, can you know, can do its own planning or its own refinement, or they can do refinement with other teams. And I would hope that if we're working on multi-team scrum scenarios, uh, that there's going to be collaboration across teams and those teams would refine together. So I really like that, Claudio, the, uh, the, the using of the words cross team refinement just a different perspective uh from um multi team refinement and less let me know if that answers your question claudio uh, eric's come back saying it's on the board absolutely it's on the board and yes we you know a lot of people who use those three questions uh, are they're trying to um uh they're trying to look busy in front of their managers or whoever the managers shouldn't be there right but uh, at the daily scrum really um because you know it's only supposed to be the developers who participate and uh i haven't seen a quite manager in a daily scrum let's put it that way um so uh yeah i, I think i think it's uh, that we need to be careful about that um ahmed's come back and says the artifacts commitment are they the minimum requirement are they the minimum requirement for transparency of the artifacts mm, i don't understand what you mean by that so i'll try to i'll try to explain what i understand Okay, so the artifacts were always there, the three artifacts. So the product backlog, the sprint backlog, and the increment. The product backlog has changed now because you've got the product goal, which is the uh, one pro one active product goal in the product backlog, and there's a commitment to strive towards that. So that that's not a hard commitment because that's like saying we know what we're going to do in 10 sprints or five sprints. We don't know. We don't even know what we'll do in this sprint, you know, because... Okay, we're committing to the sprint goal, but it's we're striving at the end of the day. We're dealing with complex work more sometimes more uh, unknown than known, so it's going to be tricky. To, uh, it's not a hard commitment; it's not an obligation. I think the only one that's close to obligation, uh, but to be careful, what that's calling an obligation would be uh, the hardest commitment. Let's put it that way would be towards the increment itself, which would be the definition of done. And in order to make sure that the the artifacts are transparent for the product backlog. You know, is all of our work in the product backlog, all the work that the team is supposed to do in the product, is it visible on the product backlog? Uh, there might be some extreme scaling situations where you want don't want to do that. That's kind of a more advanced topic when you get into less huge and huge, less huge, and so on, where you, you want to make sure the product owner understands the product backlog because you can you can also reduce transparency when the product owner doesn't understand the product backlog. Um, but to all intents and purposes, uh, we, we understand what work needs to be done in the product backlog. Sprint backlog, we've got a sprint goal, which is no part of the sprint backlog. And you've got your, your forecast, the items to deliver that sprint goal, plus some other items. Not every item in the uh, forecast needs to be towards the sprint goal. That's an, uh, people think that uh, every item has to be uh, for the sprint goal. It doesn't. And then you'd have some plan to deliver it somehow. Might be task rate or might be something else. So your sprint backlog will be transparent if all the work we're doing in the sprint is it visible on the sprint backlog? And the um, the um, increment will be transparent if we understand um, that the increment is done and we know what done means and we're all using the same definition done across them. So, um, so like I'm not sure that has changed much between apart from the fact that the sprint backlog has changed that it now has a sprint goal as a component of it, if you like, and apart from the fact that the product backlog now is a product goal. Uh, really is kind of inherently part of the uh, the product backlog. The uh, the 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 requirement for transparency has always been there, and uh, maybe it's just make it a bit clearer now because before the spring call was kind of hanging around. It was everybody knew it was mandatory, but we didn't know what to call it. The definition was kind of hanging around the end of the guy. We didn't know what to call it, and now it's kind of clear. You know the relationships are commitment, product goal, product backlog, 
sprint goal, sprint backlog, deficit done, increment. So maybe that does help. Maybe maybe directly, Amal, it does help improve uh, transparency. Let me know if that addresses uh, your question. Um, Eric has a question there, but I don't understand it, Eric. So maybe you could rephrase it. You're talking about chapters. Are you talking about chapters and guilds and all that kind of stuff? Or would you let me know where you're going with that, please? Um, um, Claudio came back saying, okay, cool, thanks. Um, Mike has come back to me. Okay. Uh, one sec there, Mike, just get your message up. Uh, do I think Scrum should advocate for mature teams to change their implementation of Scrum, like dropping, changing, add to things as they find works better and so on? Oh, that's a good question. It's a very good question. So um, really the the Scrum framework has like the minimum that you need to be doing. If you're well, if you're doing Scrum, let's put it that way. It's not the minimum you need to be doing because if you're not meeting every day, you know, you know, you're probably going to be meeting at some other times and having some wasteful meetings because you don't know what's going on. Uh, some people say you don't need um, to have a daily meeting if you're if you're doing mobbing, for example. But you, but there's a spring goal. So like just because we were sitting together yesterday, uh, doesn't mean that we know what we're doing to achieve the spring goal. So it's good to have, kind of check in how we're doing against the sprint goal. It's good to have a sprint review checking in how we're doing against the product goal. It's good to check in how we're doing as a team. Uh, okay, the, the, the scrum master maybe has less work to do with the team, but maybe he's doing more work with the organization as the team matures because the problems aren't with the team. They're uh, more visible now in the organization, so the scrum master is working there. So maybe the scrum master is less visible with the team, but still very much a service uh, to the team as well. So. I'm not sure really if things would change much. If anything, I would say you'd be kind of adding things as you get more mature. Like um, I really love um, Scrum and Kanban. So the addition of Kanban to Scrum to basically improve the flow within the sprint itself, but also uh, maybe upstream of the sprint. So uh, all that work we did to you know to before the work even comes into the Scrum team. Uh, if our overall cycle time is three months and our team is doing a two month sprint, sorry, two week sprint, sorry, you know, two months sprint, two week sprint. Um, well, you know, we're only going to get so many efficiencies from actually improving the, the effectiveness within the two week boundary. Uh, is there some stuff we, we need to be doing in our look ahead as well to be to make ourselves more efficient? So when you add, I guess this this does an, answer one of Daniel's questions from earlier because if you did want to improve the efficiency of your Scrum, you could then. Add Kanban to your Scrum to uh, improve the flow, and uh, and even then, you'd st it's still a good idea to have sprint goals. You know, where are you going? What direction? What's your direction of travel? There are alternative approaches, and uh, yours truly wrote one of them. Kanban for complexity. It's basically like Scrum, except it doesn't have a Scrum master, doesn't have a product owner, doesn't have a sprint goal, but it has a kind of a direction of travel and different time horizons. Uh, and because uh, if everybody's responsible, no one's responsible, in my opinion. Uh, you can have policies within your team where people decide who's doing the charts, who's doing looking after the stakeholders, who's looking after uh, organizing refinement or review and so on and so forth. So uh, different strokes for different folks, but officially uh, you're a scrum, it's a minimal framework. Why would you be taking things away? One of the things that I really hate, Mike, is uh, water scrum fall. And I would not want to be seen to be supporting anybody faking scrum, it just does my head in. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I like teams to kind of Select which approach suits them. I like to present options to them, even though I'm a Scrum trainer, Kanban trainer, and UX trainer. If I discover that actually there's some other approach might be more suited to them, I'd rather they use that. Uh, try to try to figure out what they believe, and then hopefully uh, uh, have them supported. I wouldn't really want them using something that didn't fit them. So I would say, Mike, if there was a really mature team and we discovered that actually. Uh, the belief system of the team was almost the opposite of the Scrum values, although they're kind of nice values, so they kind of meet the five dysfunctions of a team head on. Uh, but if you have some kind of reason why, you know, maybe they believe more in, uh, they believe in something different, uh, for example, and uh, that would be a reason maybe to move away, but that would be a very deliberate conscious choice. And I would say move to a different approach then rather than trying to take things out of Scrum because Scrum is minimal. It's uh, You should really try to Use that as a building block or kind of take stuff away from it. Mike, let me know if I've answered your question. Uh, also, by the way, Scrum but UX, I love that as well. Because some people, if they implement Scrum badly, they think uh, build it and they will come. 
And I love why when you add lean UX, you can add experimentation. You can do that with Scrum anyway, but it's just kind of gives you uh, gives you more pointers in terms of how to do that. Uh, so if people struggle how to do it, it's a really nice course. Check it out, Scrum at UX, really, really cool. Daniel's come back. Um, so what are we doing to help teams to mature and learn to make the difference between an example and a prescription? Uh, when people are using example as a rule or template instead of as an example, does it help to simply remove that example? Yeah, I can think I know where you're going. Uh, does it help to understand better the non-prescriptive nature of any framework? I can relate totally to what you're saying, Daniel. Like, um, not in the Scrum context, but uh, in the Kanban context today, somebody was asking me, like in Kanban, you've got this concept of work right, very similar to product pack like in Scrum. And they're asking me, like, uh, you know, how big should it be? And I kind of knew it was a trick question. Because uh, if I don't answer, I kind of lost. And if I answer, then they're anchored, and then they get they, they get too focused on the answer. So I said, you know, ballpark, you know, for non-software, you know, it needs to be a month or less, you know. Uh, but if you're in Kanban, you don't need to be a month or less. It could, could be longer. So, you know, don't have the item um, so small that it doesn't deliver any value. But at the same time, you know, don't have something that's taking like three months when you could actually uh, show something in a month. And so I, I often find, Daniel, I kind of, I think I understand where you're going here. I often find that when I give examples, people get anchored to them. And it doesn't matter what I say afterwards. It's like, it's like I have to work in the reverse three times faster to kind of get back to where we were. So I, I, I think I, there's a, I, I like what you're saying here. Examples can be dangerous. Uh, a lot of people like me need examples because people will tell me something theoretical, but I need to see an example. But as long as the, you're making sure that the, you're explaining that it's just in one, it's one example, it's not something to be anchored on. If you feel you're dealing with people where they don't want to get the mindset, but they just want, they just want you to show you what to do, that's kind of classic time where they just want to follow a template, you know. And they'd, uh, so even though the three questions were there in the 2017 guide, and they were only there as options, that oh, they, that's what they do because they just want to do something. They're they're not really into the spirit of the thing. So I think to answer your question, I would say be slow to use examples where you feel the readiness for agility is a bit low, because um, you might get into trouble. I might have dug a hole there, Daniel. But let me know how you get on with that. Come back to me if you want me to improve on that one. Thank you. Uh, Ahmed's come back. So in my uh, honest opinion, I think, is the commitment are related to the tactical goal. In the I would agree with that, yes. Um, in evidence-based management, they have the intermediate goal and the strategic goal. You could argue that the sprint goal is a tactical goal on the way to the intermediate goal, which would be the product goal, on the way to the vision, which is the strategic goal. You could argue that. Um, yeah, I don't disagree, Ahmad. Uh, let me know what you think of that. Thank you. Um, so Eric's come back saying, you know, one one spring call, what do you think? Yeah, I think it has to be one. I, I think where a lot of people get stuck is um, they, they they think that everything has to be for the spring call, you know? Uh, you might have five items in a sprint. Maybe only two or three of them are to do with the spring call. And then you know, like, if you're in trouble in the sprint, you kind of know, well, these are the ones we need to aim for. Uh, if we're in trouble, the other two or three are the ones that are going to be the sacrificial lamb, sacrificial lamb so to speak. Although items might be reducing technical debt, um, uh, maybe some improvement action if, you, if you're still using that philosophy of putting improvements into the next sprint. That's not my cup of tea. I prefer to do the improvements uh, in the retrospective itself. Um, that's just me, John Coleman, personally speaking. Um, I think when you've got more, more than one sprint goal, it's a kind of a sign there's a lack of priorities. So maybe if the, if it's possible to try and shorten the sprint so that you can you know just kind of focus on one thing and then go on to the next one. Of course, the the duration of your sprint is going to be a factor of you know how long uh, will it take before the the product owner changes their mind and and also well how quickly can you release stuff? You can if you can get stuff out the door in two weeks, why have a three week sprint? Uh, you know, sprint in two weeks and uh, and then hopefully have one sprint call. So just don't make the mistake of thinking uh, uh, that. Everything in the sprint has to be for that sprint goal. It's okay for other items to not be aiming for the sprint goal. Uh, if that helps, I hope that helps. I saw one once, I saw a sprint goal once where literally what they did was they concatenated all the words of all the items in the sprint and said, that's the sprint goal. In other words, do stuff, finish finish those items. 
probably the worst goal in the world, right? So it needs to be some kind of North Star, so to speak, for the sprint. Let me know if that helped, Eric. Ahmed is saying uh, that that did so, and then Eric came back saying only one. Yeah, only one sprint goal. Yeah, I would. Have, yeah, rare, rare, it's rare cases. But you see, you know, if I give an example, it's like John Coleman said on a live stream, that it's okay, you could have two. Uh, see, this is the problem, right? So never say never, but yeah, 99.9% of the time, one spring call, I would say, uh, Eric, in a scrum context anyway. Okay, so LinkedIn user, but the new scrum guide says dailies are optional. No, it doesn't. Show me where it says that. Uh, this, uh, we might we might have to have a look at the uh, the scrum guide. I might uh, I might need to open it up in my other browser. I don't know what you think? So uh, just going to uh, open up the scrum guide here. So scrum guides uh, on this side. Uh, maybe I'm, I hope I'm not going to be standing corrected now. But uh, scrumguides.org. Which I'd be careful you don't spill my cup of tea or my keyboard. That would not be uh, that would not be good. Not scrum guides. Scrum guides. This is a good website to go by, guys. Um, scrumguys.org and I'm just going to read it online and I'm just going to make sure that I've got it shared so let me just fix that first uh, yeah I'm going to share it now uh, and I just turn off some of the banner stuff as well so you can you get to see more of the uh, of the guide itself and I'll just turn off your comment as well so we can actually see it okay so if I go through the guide itself uh, and uh, the daily scrum right so if you just go to developer, blah, 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 here are the events. Sprint planning, daily scrum, right? So uh, I need to make this a bit wider so you can see more. Hopefully you can see this okay in your screen. Okay. So the purpose, uh, sorry, went to the wrong place. Purpose of the daily scrum, daily scrum, is to inspect progress towards the sprint goal and adapt the sprint backlog as necessary, adjusting the upcoming work. The daily scrum is a 15 minute event for the developers of the scrum team to reduce complexity decided at the same time and place every working day of the sprint if the product owner or scrum master are actively working on items they can do so yeah it's it's i don't see how it's optional i don't know how you uh, un understood that it was optional it's saying every day um it's saying okay it's usually at the same time every day but it doesn't doesn't have to be you know as one guy as one pst said to me uh uh, we we do our daily scrum every every uh, every day at nine o'clock, and on Thursday we do it at half past ten. Does that mean we're not doing scrum? According to twenty seventeen guys, you could have, you could have argued that, but in, thankfully in twenty twenty uh, that's not the case. Um, and I'm not saying that's the case, by the way. But I'm just I'm just having a little bit of a bit of a joke. Hope you don't mind. You know, adding a bit of humor. So let me know if that answers your question. LinkedIn user a question mark was your name. Um, uh, so I've got. Another couple of questions here now. Uh, Mike has come back. Thank you, Mike. Eric, uh, I don't think sprint calls are always necessary, only if the teams find it valuable. Well, Mike, in the in Scrum, it's mandatory. The sprint goal is mandatory. Um, and uh, in Kanban for Complexity, I didn't have a sprint goal, but I had, uh, uh, as uh, Ahmad said, I had kind of a equivalent to tactical, intermediate, and strategic direction of travel that you're going in because you do need to know where you're going otherwise you'll end up somewhere else as yogi Berra said um uh, what i find is if teams don't have sprint goals they end up with sh star t lists it's just stuff you know and uh, the team will finish that stuff and then they get more stuff uh that's one reason why i like sprint goals the second one is um it unleashes the creativity of the team and i was working in a a large manufacturing uh, supply chain company. Um, we had a sprint goal and we had 10 items in the sprint. I was a bit naive as a scrum master. That's way too many items in a sprint, right? But uh, anyway, we had 10 items in the sprint and we figured out a way to deliver the sprint goal with three of the items if we made a change to the third one. And we went to the parlor, we said to her, uh, we think we delivered the sprint goal with these three items. Is that okay? She said, yeah. So we didn't have to deliver the other seven. So, like, the danger of not having sprint goals is you're not unleashing the creativity of the team. It's just an SH star T list. It's not very inspiring. It's just meh. And, uh, you know, it's, yeah, it doesn't really work for me. Okay, that's your opinion. That's fine, Mike. But if you're doing scrum, um, sprint goals are mandatory. Um, so, uh, Eric has come back. Uh, I like it so much as well. Uh, uh, Push-pull mix, depending on the value. 
complex, uh, complicated. So, um, Erica, lost context there in terms of what you mean. Um, is it the, the new version of the guide that you like, or is it some other thing, something else that you like? The push-pull mix, depending on the value you deliver. Trying to understand that, because for me, it's mostly pull. Um, so try to understand what you mean by that. Let me know what you, uh, I know you're very good agilist, so uh, just let me know what you meant by that. Thank you. Andre, uh, he's a regular on the show. And uh, so John, can you clarify a statement? Uh, the, uh, oh, no, it didn't say that. It's a, the Scrum Master is not, it's not accountable for team success. It's um, for the effectiveness of the Scrum team. Now you might interpret it as those words, right? Uh, now, it is something that expected as a must and Scrum Master responsibility. No, so okay, you have to be careful here, right? So this is where I think it's get, getting a bit tricky because in the Scrum Guide, if we go to the Scrum Master, right? Let's have a look at the Scrum Guide, okay? And uh, where is it? Uh, guys, is it up or down? I'm, uh, my scroll isn't working. Here we go. Uh, so Scrum Master. So Scrum Team, Developers, Product Owner, Scrum Master, right? Uh, so the Scrum Master is accountable for, am I sharing my screen? Let me just check. Uh, sometimes I forget to, I am sharing my screen, that's good. Okay, so the Scrum Master is accountable for establishing Scrum as defined by the guy. They do this by helping everyone understand, blah, blah, blah. The Scrum Master is accountable for the Scrum team's effectiveness. They do this by enabling the team to improve its practices within the framework. So essentially using the different stances of a scrub master, you know, teaching, coaching, mentoring, removing impediments, looking after the framework, you know, uh, also working at the organization level and so on. Uh, so accountable, so if the team isn't uh, being very effective um, and it's on your watch and you're the scrum master, it's kind of like, it's not like you're to blame or anything like, but you know, it's like, you know, if, if it's on your watch, the team has not been very effective, you know, I hope you're doing things too. And I know you would be Andrew, because I know you're a very good practitioner. I would hope the Scrum Master's read that, but it's not really about, you know, uh, let's uh, let's take the Scrum Master out and, and shoot her because uh, the team wasn't effective. It's that, uh, that's not the intent. The, team, the Scrum team still needs to be self-managing. Uh, but what can we do from a kind of a backstage leadership point of view to kind of encourage the, the growth and the improvement of, of the team? Uh, let me know if uh, that satisfies your question, Andrew. Um, so I got, um, I've got i got um, Daniel coming back here and uh, I'm losing context as a mis mis jumping between the messages here. It was, indeed, it was just an example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, any facilitation I do and I give an example, it's like I always regret it. I feel like I need to give one and then I regret it afterwards. So if you can find a way, metaphors are very good. You can use metaphors. Metaphors are dangerous too because they, they usually break down, but uh, they can be good to, uh, to, to, to get a story across. Um, so <clears throat> Daniel's come back. Uh, thank you, John, everyone. See you for a while. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so Eric, hmm, I, was, I was hesitating depending on the context. Thanks for your comment. Yeah, so sometimes, Eric, as well, you know, what happens in some companies is uh, they decide they're, they're going to use Scrum, you know, and uh, the team really doesn't have a choice, and, you know, and so they're using uh, a framework that maybe doesn't suit them, you know, so uh can be tricky sometimes. That's why I do have another option, Kanban for complexity. Uh, so, uh, for example, we can't deliver something in 30 days, and Scrum, you need to be able to deliver something in 30 days. Okay, less uh, huge, for example, with multiple teams does cater for a situation where maybe you can't deliver a potentially shippable increment at the end of a sprint and then you have undone work and all that kind of cool stuff. But there, that's kind of a, that's kind of not what we're talking about today. We're kind of talking mostly about single team scrum today. Thank you, Eric, for your comments and coming back to me. So Daniel Dwarren comes back here. Daniel Dwarren, actually, Daniel, I haven't seen you today yet, but thank you for joining. So the new scrum guide says dailies can be called only when needed. It does? I'd love to see where it says that. Uh, maybe you were LinkedIn user question mark earlier, were you? Uh, so uh, I'd love to know where it says that. Oh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way now. Let me go to daily. So maybe if we just do a search for the word only. <laughs> so I'm, we read the first paragraph, then we read the second paragraph, 15 minute meeting. Okay. 
Developers can select whatever structure they want as long as their daily scrum focuses on progress. So in other words, you don't have to use the three questions. This uh, improves focus and self-management. Daily scrums improve communications and constantly eliminate the need for other meetings. It's not the only time developers, uh, they often meet throughout the day. So I, I don't know where you got that, Daniel. It doesn't say that at all as far as I'm concerned, but sometimes two people look at the same document to see different things. So maybe you can just uh, reach out to me offline and just uh, let me know where you saw that because I, I don't see that at all. Um, Andre uh, says, yes, thank you. Eric uh, saying clear, thank you very much. And uh, Daniel seems pretty sure, that's fine. You just need to show me, Daniel. Um, you can jump on the call if you want. I can I can add a link if you want. You can jump on with me. Sure, Daniel, no problem. You can. I'll be doing more of these calls anyway. We've been live actually for an hour. Um, so now what I'm going to ask you is, uh, does anyone have any more questions? Because uh, I'm just going to give it another few minutes because we, I might do this again next week. Any more questions about Scrum? And uh, uh, just checking, have I addressed every question as well? Uh, I think I have. Thank you very much for your level of engagement today. I thought I was going to be able to go live on LinkedIn Live on my company page, but I had an error message, so I had to last minute change it going to my company, uh, to my personal profile. So I hope you managed to, um, everyone managed, managed to find uh find me on the on the thing anyway this is uh this is recorded anyway so it's the beauty of uh streaming uh we've got uh, recordings all right so um i think what i'll do just while i'm waiting for you to uh, submit any last minute questions and comments uh i just want to kind of reflect a little bit uh no no problem at all uh i'm delighted to take your questions uh you kept me on my toes this evening. Thank you very much for that. Really good questions. Um, so just about um, the whole spirit of the thing, one of the things I liked about the addition of the Scrum values to the Scrum Guide in 2016 is it kind of checked in on whether you were in the spirit of the thing. You know, were you, are you really, uh, are you really embracing Scrum? Or are you just you know, just doing it mechanically, you know, as, as Barry Overeem and Christian Vervey say, you know, I, I, you're doing zombie scrum, you know, fake scrum, dark scrum, whatever you want to call it. And so I liked the scrum, I liked the scrum values. And I like that there's accountabilities in the 2020 guide as well, because now what's happening is essentially you're kind of tapping into the opposite of the five assumptions of a team for Patrick and Cioni. I'm not sure if that was... Um, coincidental or intentional, but I, I, I really, really like that. Um, uh, you know, are we in the spirit? Of I really like that there's, they're, make, they're being really clear that if you've won product, that you've got one product owner. Probably one thing I don't really like so much in the latest guide is the definition of product. It's a bit vague and you could be, as they say in America, you could drive a bus through it. You know, you could uh, drive a truck through the gap. You know, it's really open to interpretation, uh, makes me uncomfortable. Uh, but on the right hands, uh, it can be very useful. And I'm glad that they've uh, finally added the word customer and I think end user into the guide. It's nice to see that, love to see more of that, uh, more kind of outside in thinking. Um, and really encouraged to see the promotion of uh, experiments. The word, I think the word experiment is explicit, made explicit in there. And that, so that's really, really nice. And also, what makes it easier for me as well as a coach and a trainer is um, that uh, these kind of antibodies that were coming up before, that it's just for software, lots of software words, uh, kind of irritated people. And frankly, it created a bit of drag during coaching and training that maybe wasn't really needed. And uh, it's it was uh, not so desirable. So I'm kind of really glad um, that... Uh, They've removed most of those words. Some people are uncomfortable with that. But of course, if you're teaching people who do software, you can use the language. You know, Scrum is still Scrum, so you can use some of the language from the 2017 guide. Um, it's not a problem. Uh, but if you, you need something that's uh, kind of more suitable to a more uh, diverse audience, diverse not from the point of view of diversity and inclusion, but from the point of view of um, uh, different types of work. You know, is it science? Is it uh, engineering? Is it... Uh, you know, construction or whatever. Now, construction is really a bad example, but maybe a very complex construction. Um, you know, could be. I think it's. Uh, I think it's valuable. So it's really nice that they made Scrum flexible now, so it can be used for those. And I can see how 
it might uh, the new guide might have less resistance. Well, people they say people don't resist change; they resist being changed. But less um, resistance is probably the wrong word, but um, less antibodies. Let's put it that way. Less um, less inclined to uh, uh, to kind of kind of go against it and feel that it's not designed for them. That uh, the, the, a lot of things were taken out of the scrum guide to simplify it and um, and to make it uh, less prescriptive. So I think that's very, very welcome. I'm a bit unsure about the whole protocol thing, about one active protocol at a time. You know, I'm happy to support the official line and that's fine, but uh, kind of makes me a bit uncomfortable because if you have some other subsequent protocols uh, that might need to become active um, for whatever reason, depending on the context, does that mean we're breaking scrum then? And you know, there should really be no funnel the product backlog should be where everything is and for, as far as I'm concerned. So uh, I hope we're not going down the road of kind of encouraging people to store work for subsequent protocols in different containers. I think that would be that would be a, a slippy slope and I'd err on the side of keeping everything on the product backlog. Again, that's just John Coleman speaking personally. That's not an official view uh, from any organization other than my own company and myself. Um, so just uh, two final comments before we go. Um, Need to leave. Thanks, Eric, for joining. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, enjoy your evening, everyone. And uh, Claudio, uh, product vision better than the protocol. I think the vision creates less friction. Um, you could argue that, Claudio. You know, uh, if you look at the evidence-based management guide, you could also say, Do you know what, the protocol is kind of like the intermediate goal. You know what I mean? You could argue. It could also. It's so bloody vague. It could be. Uh, could also be the the vision in in your terms, um, uh, Claudio. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of not decided myself, really, Claudio, on it, but uh, direction of travel is the language I try to use uh, because uh, we're really just trying to uh, evolve from where we are. And, uh, you know, uh, it's not like we know everything that's going to happen in the future, right? So we, we go, want to go in a particular direction. We don't particularly know where we're going to end up, but we have an idea where we might want to go. And I think that's, I think that's what we need. Um, so thank you very much, Claudio, and thank you very much for watching. I'm going to leave it there for the evening. I'll probably do another set, one of these sessions on Kanban. So ask ask me about anything about Kanban. So I'd be very welcome. I'd be delighted to have you. I might do it in uh, the coming days or in the next week. Uh, uh, please leave comments and please share if you liked what you saw. And if you want to see more of these videos, uh, just subscribe to me or follow whichever channel you came through. And thank you so much uh, for joining. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Thank you very much. Over and out.